Hello everyone and welcome to Geotab's online training. Thanks for joining us today for Tuesday's talk. This is Carrie Carter and I have today with me Angie Milne. She's going to join us today and Angie's going to share with us all about fuel data, engine diagnostics and maintenance reminders. And with that, Angie, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Carrie. So uh, as she, uh, Carrie just mentioned, I'm going to be going over at um, a bit of a high level, but also a little bit of training on um, how you can view the fuel data, engine diagnostics, and maintenance reminders in the MyGeotab system. So to start, I'm going to talk about fuel data. Just a, a majority of newer vehicles these days, I, we'd say about 2008 and newer, will provide us uh, fuel information through the ECM. Now, what Geotab has been able to do is to actually take in this data and not only provide you with MPG information, but you can also see the trends of that MPG and fuel, fuel purchased or fuel pumped and possible fill-up events. So some of the common fuel data that can be seen in my Geotab are the total fuel used since the telematics device was installed. We can actually also see the total fuel used while idling since the device was installed. And then incidentally, we can even see the total fuel used during a particular trip. Same with the idle. And one of the great features is that we are able to see a fuel level from certain vehicles. Now, I do want to uh, mention that not all vehicles provide direct fuel information. Some will come through as mass airflow, which is then calculated to fuel used within our system. Just wanted to show some graphs here, which are actually found in the Geotab product guide. Just gives you an idea of, by make, what the percentage is uh, as far as the support goes for fuel level and fuel usage. Now, obviously, we don't have the years in here, but it gives you a really good idea on what vehicles we're able to, to get this information on. And you can see we've got quite a big range of vehicles that we're able to get this fuel information on, which is great. Now, if for some reason, you know, you've got a fleet, a mixed fleet, and some of your vehicles, you're not seeing them getting any fuel information. By all means, check this, uh, these charts out in the product guide and see if that maker model just, you know, we're not able to get the information. But also, you know, you can definitely put in a, a support ticket with our team here. Uh, for customers, definitely reach out to your reseller and let them know that uh, you're not getting fuel information on that vehicle, and we'll do our best to see if we can find it uh, in that vehicle. Now, we're talking about the fuel usage and MPG. So we do have a fuel usage report uh, in the MyGeotab product, and it will show you the fuel burned uh, per vehicle for that time period that you choose, as well as the MPG and the distance uh, driven. You can also view trended fuel information, which is great. So you can actually see how your fleet is doing you know, week over week, day over day. Now, I do in this slide deck, I do show you kind of step by step on how you can navigate through the system to get to what I'm going to show you. But what I like to do is kind of walk through it live and really give you a feel for how it actually looks in the system. Now, before I hop into the fuel usage report, I do have a quick note at the bottom of this slide here. You may not see every vehicle that you chose in the list on the report. The reason being is only the vehicles that provide valid fuel information will show up in the fuel usage report because we would rather show valid data rather than no data or bad data. So I just wanted to, to mention that because we have had some, some people confused uh, you know, as to why they're not seeing their vehicles. So I'm just going to pop out of my slide deck here and I'm just going to go into my database here. Now, I already have the fuel usage report open, but from anywhere in the software, you would simply just go to, on the side panel, under engine and maintenance, you would just click on fuel usage. Now, when you come in here, you want to go straight to your options, and you can see here that we have the ability to run the report by this month or last month, but as always in other areas of our software, you can run it uh, for a custom time period as well. Now, what I've done with this particular report is I've run it for last month, and I want to see that trended information. So I've selected on for where it says sub-periods, and that allows me to trend the information either daily, weekly, or monthly, so depending on the date period that you've chosen. So if I wanted to look at maybe last week, I could choose daily, and it will actually spit out a line for every day of the week and give me all the MPG and fuel information for that day. 
Here I've broken it down for last month and I want to know what my information was for every week of that month. Now if you do have historic vehicles in your database, you can absolutely uh, run your reports based on that. So you would just select, select yes here. For me, I just want to run it for an active vehicle. So I'm not going to hit apply changes, I already have it open here. So right off the bat, you can see that I have four lines of data and those represent the weeks in the month. You can see that by looking at the date and time frame over on the right hand side. And then you can see the distance driven for that week, how much fuel was used, and then based on that information we can tell you what the MPG is for that vehicle. Now you can see that I'm looking at this in US measurements, so I've got gallons and, and miles per gallon, but depending on your user options, if you're in Canada, I could set it up so that I view it in uh, liters and show it as liters per hundred kilometers. So that is all in your individual user options and you can set it up whichever way you want to view the data. Now I'm just going to go back to my slide deck here. So this is just telling you exactly what it was that I just showed you. That um, you'd see one line per week with the total distance driven, the fuel used, MPG, or liters per hundred kilometers, as well as the date range for the week. Now, one great new feature that we recently put out there, it is still technically in, in beta, uh, but we do have it released in the software for anybody to see, is what we are calling the Phillips report. This is actually a really, really cool report. Our, our engineers here have actually figured out a way to determine when a vehicle has filled up with gas or diesel fuel. So you can access it in two different ways from that same screen that I was just at, the fuel usage screen. You can click on the Phillips button, which is at the top uh, in the navigation bar, which you can see in the screenshot below is uh, highlighted with that red around it. Or you can actually click on any one of those lines to see the Phillips for that particular week or day or whichever uh, time frame you're looking at. Now I already have it pre-selected here. I, I chose my second week. And you can see here for that week I only had one Phillip, which makes sense. But you can see here, I've got the date and the time of when it occurred. I have the location. Now you can see here, I actually have a zone around the location, so it's showing me the, the zone name. If I did not have a zone around that, it would just show the address like you know in the TRIPS detailed report. Now the great thing here is you can see it says 35.62 MPG. What that means is it's basically telling me the MPG from the last fill-up to this fill-up. And you can see if I hover over the little fuel tank icon, it's telling me I used 10 gallons over 361 miles. And you can see 10 gallons here, I hover over, it's telling me that's the volume added. And then it's telling me with the uh, odometer at the time of the fill-up. Now, going back to the presentation, I just want to talk a little bit about how we're able to get this information. So we've created an algorithm to determine when we're, we see these events. So right from when the Go device is first installed, our algorithm will track each trip and monitor the fuel data to determine when we see the fuel level increase, um, as well as looking at the fuel used, combining those two together. I'm not going to get into too much detail on how the algorithm works, but based on the behavior that we see in the vehicle, we can actually determine after a few fill-ups how large the fuel tank is in the vehicle, knowing that you know that you know the driver probably waits till he's completely empty and then he fills it all the way full again. So we'll be able to know based on the fuel used, you know how much or how large that uh, fuel tank is. The Phillips report. Let me go back into here. That's how we're able to see that 10 gallons. So we've been able to, based on some of the information that we've gotten, that. I filled up 10 gallons in my in my tank. And like I mentioned, it is in beta, but we're seeing some really great uh, results with this uh, with this data. Now, if I had multiple fill-ups, then you can see up here on the top, it would give me my totals. Uh, but for this one, I just have the one. Now, you can see here, all I'm seeing is a line of data, but I can do more with this. I've got a magnifying glass here. So obviously what that means is I can actually view that on uh, the live map to see exactly where the vehicle was when we detected this fill up information. So it's showing me here that that Canadian Tire gas station and if I zoom in I can see that yes I was at the pump when I filled that up. So, so it's kind of helpful for 
not necessarily fuel fraud, but just to kind of keep an eye on how often they're filling up their tanks, if they're, you know, waiting till the very end, or if they're doing it halfway. You know, maybe it's uh, not necessarily that they do it this often. It's a, it's a really great tool to have. Now, something a little bit more technical. We do have the ability to view the data that we're looking at um, to determine this information on a graph. So I've got a little graph icon here, and I'm just going to show you what I'm seeing here. So it looks a little bit scary at first, but it's actually some really, really cool stuff that we've got going on here. So I can see right here at 4.15, 44, um, the blue line is showing me the fuel added or the fuel used in the vehicle. So depending on if I've added fuel or not, it's going to go down or it's going to go up. The other line, the red line, is actually showing me the fuel level in the vehicle. So we can actually determine based on the fuel level and the fuel used when the actual vehicle filled up uh, with gas. So this is basically going down and you can look at the dates and times below. You know, this is the 8th, the 9th, you know, I'm getting lower and lower as far as fuel added, fuel used, and the fuel level. So it really makes sense when you look at the two of them together that you can actually start to see when it gets filled up again and we can determine how much it's putting in. A little bit of a high level, I didn't want to go into too much detail on the algorithm, but it's pretty neat how you can actually verify the fuel information and that yes, it is correct, there really was a fill up on the vehicle. So as I mentioned, this slide deck is really just giving you a step-by-step -step on how I was able to, to get this information and how you will be able to get to it as well. Okay, moving on to engine diagnostics. A lot of this uh, information can also be found, once again, in our product guide. We have some pretty extensive information in there that you can look at to, to get anything, really, that, on how our system works in that product guide. So I'm just going to read this a little bit verbatim here. So, in order to determine whether a vehicle is driving, stationary, or turned off, the system uses a patented technology to examine vehicle battery voltage, movement by use of accelerometer, and GPS location and available engine status information. So some of the key points there when we're talking about engine data is the, the vehicle battery voltage and the engine status information. So our device is able to, because we plug in directly into the engine diagnostics port, um, we're actually able to determine the battery voltage on the vehicle. In doing that, we can actually detect, you know, let's say if the vehicle was in a, a two-wire mode and we're not reading ignition information, we can actually detect based on voltage and accelerometer movement if the vehicle has started moving and if it's driving. So it's pretty cool by being able to tap into that information, what we can see with the system. So this allows the system to be used in vehicles that do not include an engine bus like I just mentioned with the two-wire, uh, in new electronic or hybrid vehicles, commercial vans, and large trucks. We even have our devices installed in, seen some ATVs, some snowmobiles, even somebody put it on their bicycle with some batteries. So, some pretty cool stuff. Now back to the engine information. In particular, let's look at some odometer. So, for some vehicles, we can actually get odometer straight from the ECM. But depending on some of the older vehicles out there, let's go back you know, to the standard you know, 2008 and newer, we most likely will get odometer on the vehicle. Some of the older vehicles, we may not uh, necessarily get that from the ECM. They may not even have it. So it all depends on the, the manufacturer, but also the age of the vehicle. If the uh, engine is not actually providing us the odometer information, you can update it in the my Geotab database manually just by entering what the current odometer reading is and then going forward from there our system will actually calculate the odometer based on GPS distance. Now the application retroactively corrects historical odometer readings based on the most recently entered value whether that value is manually entered or automatically recorded. So this most recent value is always assumed to be the correct and overrides all the previous entries or corrections. Now, if for some reason, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail that I didn't cover in the slides here, but 
we have seen some vehicles where, let's say, the uh, engine computer has been replaced or something like that. It hasn't been reset. So it, the odometer value is showing different on the dash of the vehicle than it is from what we're pulling from the engine computer. Other times could be some older vehicles where the dashboard uh, odometer is an analog, so it's kind of that slow little ticker moving up, increasing. That may be different from what we're getting from the engine computer because they're two completely different technologies. So if somebody goes and sees that the odometer is off, let's say, by 100 miles from what we're seeing in the system, they can update the odometer manually in the system just by going into the device edit, put in what the current odometer reading is. If they want to go off of that dashboard and not by what the computer is saying, they can put that manual entry in there. And then our system will actually create a, an offset in the background. So as the vehicle moves, as the uh, odometer is incremented from the engine computer, we will take that offset into consideration and we will increase or decrease. So we'll always make sure that we're showing what you want to see in the system, depending on if you want to look at that dashboard information or the information directly from the ECM. Okay, so a couple of things about odometer, uh, because we know it can be a little bit finicky. If there is incorrectly entered information, it can result in inaccurate reports. So I'm just going to go through the list here. Incorrectly copying or entering an odometer value might produce negative historical trip values. So you want to be very careful when you're entering your odometer values manually into the system. Now, when a telematics device firmware update introduces uh, odometer into the system where the odometer values were previously manually entered but incorrect, it could produce a jump in the value. Another point to, to bring up, if a telematics device is moved from one vehicle to another but the old vehicle was not marked as historic, so it's still active in the system, then the odometer readings for the multiple vehicles are combined. This could result in sudden jumps or path negative trips. Here's some recommendations that we have. Definitely double, triple check your manual odometer readings when you're entering them into the system. Make sure they're 100% accurate with what you're seeing at that current time. So when you enter the odometer into the database, it has to be what the current odometer is on the vehicle, not what it was yesterday, because you're going to see a difference. When you're permanently transferring your telematics device to a new vehicle, we always recommend to set the previous vehicle to historic to preserve your location data and any other information and create a new vehicle with that telematics device. That makes sure that we've got two completely separate entries and that the odometer values aren't overriding or combining. Now, one thing I want to point out is that we do have a feature called pinning a device. So by default, all the devices are pinned in every single database, but you do have the option to unpin them. Now what that means is when a device is pinned, it will act the way we always know it so that we may run into these uh, issues here. If you were to put a device into another vehicle, we may see that the odometer will be combined and you'll see those sudden jumps. Now if you don't pin the vehicle, we actually have a feature in place that we can detect when a device has been unplugged from a vehicle and plugged into a new completely different vehicle based on, uh, on the VIN. So if the VIN changes, what our system will do is it will automatically create that existing vehicle as historic and it will create a new vehicle entry and assign that uh, serial number to it. And it will actually call it new vehicle and it will have the serial number of the device and it will say what vehicle that device was previously in. So it's a great little feature if you don't want to worry about manually going in there and, and changing things around, making vehicles historic and, and creating new entries. If you have them unpinned, it will automatically uh, create these for you. Now that is you know, based on if we're getting VIN on the vehicles, there's a couple of factors in, in place there, so you want to make sure that um, we're getting the right data on the vehicles to be able to detect that information. Okay, moving on to seatbelt. From what we've seen, seatbelts are used much less than you would expect. By monitoring, you know, the compliance can go from 80% to 99.8%, and this was actually from a large case study that we have. Our system is able to read 
seatbelt information from a lot of vehicles these days, you can see that the seatbelt support is not as vast as we saw uh, with the odometer and the fuel. And that is um, a lot of the times it's relating to the actual manufacturers. Now, we actually do have an algorithm where we can detect seatbelt usage based on the data from the first few trips of the vehicle after the device was installed. So our system, it's, it's kind of uh, behavior based. What we're looking for is standard seatbelts use, you know, where somebody gets in their vehicle, their seatbelt is unbuckled, you know, they're probably uh, either going to buckle it before they start the ignition um, or they're going to start the ignition and buckle it, they're going to drive, unbuckle. So we're looking for that standard behavior of a seatbelt so that we make sure that we, we pick up the proper uh, data set you know, we're not picking up a rear door opening or something along those lines. So it takes us a, a few trips for us to kind of determine the seatbelt data and then we'll be able to provide you with that accurate information. Now what we do do is at the beginning and uh, the end of a trip, is we'll kind of reset that seatbelt information. So let's say at the beginning of a trip, we're going to see a minus one beside the seatbelt's log. That means that it's reset it's kind of in a, a nothing state and then once we start to see the seatbelt data we'll pass that through so then we'll see okay well actually it looks like the seatbelt is unbuckled so we'll log that and then we'll see okay now they've buckled it and we'll, we'll put that log through at the end of the trip we'll go back to that unknown or nothing state to make sure that rules that are being created on the seatbelt data aren't coming up as inaccurate just in case maybe the device was unplugged you know mid-trip or at the end of the trip we want to make sure that we're not looking at days worth of seatbelt unbuckled we always want to put it into that kind of reset state okay so I'm going to actually look at uh, engine measurements in my geotab so uh, once again, I do have my step-by-step -step information here, but I'm just going to pop back over to my database. Same area to get to it. So you would go to engine and maintenance on the side panel. You would click on engine data and then engine measurements. I will go through engine faults in a, in a moment, but uh, engine measurements is where we're actually going to see all the engine data coming through for the vehicle for the time period. So our options are similar to what they were before. We've got our date and time period. We've got a little bit more options than we did in the fuel usage report. So because of the amount of data that we're looking at, we always want to offer, you know, you can look at it for just today, yesterday, weekly information, monthly information, and we do still offer the custom option as well. There could be, you know, accident data that you want to look at for yesterday, but only for, you know, one hour's worth. So you can really drill down and get just what you're looking for. Choose your vehicle and your diagnostics. Now, most of the time I'll leave this blank if I just kind of want to look at all the data that's coming through in the vehicle, but you can choose the diagnostic as well. So we've got a, a list of all the diagnostics that we are reading on the vehicles. Now, this is not necessarily uh, what we're reading on these vehicles. This is just engine data that we can get. I always recommend to leave this blank and run the report to see what this particular vehicle is providing us with. So just going to kind of go through this report here and show you what we're looking at. This is actually my vehicle and we can see it's calling it telematics device voltage but because we're reading that from the battery it's essentially the battery voltage. So we can see that the battery voltage was at 12.29 volts and you can see that I turned my ignition on. So ignition value of one, meaning that it's active. So the ignition was turned on. And then we're getting a couple of accelerometer readings, but you can see here that nothing really is kind of an alert. So not only are we seeing engine data, but we're even seeing the data coming through from the telematics device itself. Right away, I can see my, my seatbelt is unbuckled, and then I buckled it right away after that. We're getting a couple more uh, voltage readings and some accelerometer readings. So what this means is now that we're actually seeing some of these accelerometers change, it means that the vehicle is moving. Now my particular vehicle doesn't give me a, a lot of engine data, but I do have an example in the slide deck that I'm going to show you of, uh, of a vehicle that has some, a lot of uh, interesting stuff. One of the things here you can see is cranking voltage. So cranking voltage, device voltage or battery voltage are going to be your standard uh, pieces of information that you're going to get on every vehicle as well as the ignition unless it's a, a two-wire and we're not getting ignition. 
So as we go through here, you can see that it's detected, the CAN protocol. So this is a light duty vehicle. It's even actually giving me my, my fuel information. So I've got my total fuel used since the telematics device install. So it's a big number. Uh, you can see it is showing it in liters. I've got my, my seatbelt is actually reset to zero. And this was at the, I think was at, at the end of the trip. And then it's giving me my idling fuel, my odometer value, my RPM. So you can see lots of information uh, in here. Now, I can actually view any piece of information here on a graph. The reason why we would want to view it on a graph, it really comes in handy when we're looking at um, an accident. So if we want to go ahead and recreate an accident or find out exactly what happened uh, during this accident or leading up to it, we can actually view the accelerometer value, we can view a couple of other pieces here. So in my example in the slide deck, I'm actually looking at the side to side. So if I want to look at the acceleration side to side, so it's looking at left and right uh, turns, I can just click on any one of them. So it doesn't have to be the first one. And what it's going to do is it's going to give me a graph for the time period of just that piece of data. So you can see here I've got some times where it's just kind of flat, flattened out here. Then I'm seeing some data and it's flattened out. Now I see some, some pretty cool stuff over here on the right hand side. So I want to zoom into that. Now to do that I can just scroll with my mouse, which is what I just did there, and then I can drag over. I can also just click on the magnifying glass here and that will do the exact same thing and then I can drag over to see that information. So I think the one example I wanted to show was this beginning one here. Okay, now I'm not expecting you to know uh, the values of the accelerometer. Just so you know, the values that we're looking at here, 3.2 meters per second squared is not a lot. We're really just looking at left and right turns here. So if you imagine the vehicle driving along this zero line here and he's driving forward, you can see there's a left turn and there's a right turn. Maybe a little bit of a curve there, went on the road. These are actual uh, turns, maybe possibly. I could have just maybe changed lanes or something like that. So it's really, really neat that I can see this here, but I want to show you what it looked like on the, the map itself. So if I just go over to the live map, I'm just going to actually right click on the live map and open it in a new tab. Because it's web-based, I can kind of have multiple tabs open for the same database. And I'm just going to go to Trips History and I'm going to choose that vehicle and I want to look at yesterday. And I know that this is the, the trip that I want to look at. Okay, so right here is that accelerometer data that we were just looking at. So you can see I've, I come off the highway, I do a left turn, and then I'm turning onto the road, and you can see I do go around a big curve, driving straight, going around a couple other curves, I make a left and a right, and then I park my vehicle. So it's really neat to be able to put those two together. You can, uh, you can see that Yes, I made a left turn, I, I made a right turn, I went around a curve, made a left turn in, and then I parked my vehicle. So it's, it's a nice way to, um, to look at the data. Now, if there was uh, an actual accident, we would most likely see a very large spike in either direction, um, and then, but we could see the data leading up to it if they were swerving to it or if they were driving straight and so forth. Now, the other pretty cool thing that I can do is I can add data onto this graph. So right now I'm just looking at acceleration side to side, but let's say I want to look at acceleration forward or braking. Okay, so I can add this in here in the options. I'm going to keep my other options the same because I want to look at the same data set, and I'm going to apply the changes. So it's, it zoomed me back out, but I can just zoom back into that, uh, that time frame. So you can see here, what we're looking at is in the positive direction is forward and in the negative is braking. So it kind of correlates to, to the data that we're looking at. So you can see that there was a, 
remember the blue line is the side to side, so that was a left turn, and then the right turn over here. So I had to accelerate during a, a corner. You know, I was accelerating here. I had to brake because I'm going right, and then I accelerate again, and you can see right here I'm accelerating through the curve. I'm braking here, but I'm still going, uh, I'm not turning, I'm, I'm staying straight. So I had a vehicle in front of me, I had to put on the brakes a little bit, that's fine. And then I start to accelerate again, and then we've got a, a, an even line here on the forward and braking, um, but, I'm, but I'm doing a slight little curve, and then you can see it almost goes opposite there. So once again, another really neat way to, uh, to view accident data. Uh, by combining that information. Now I can also put in uh, my vehicle speed onto this graph. And let me just uh, go back over here. And you can see here the orange line is the posted road speeds. So we're even getting that information. And then the blue line is my logged speed. Now that was, uh, I believe that was on the highway there, but if I go over here, I'm not getting posted road speed information on this particular road, but I am seeing my actual vehicle speed. So now I can combine vehicle speed with the other data and really get a good picture of, of what exactly is happening with that vehicle. So it's a little bit more technical, a little bit more detailed, um, but I really wanted to show that, uh, that information because I think it could be very, very helpful. Now, the engine measurements report can be exported to Excel as well as the fuel usage report. So we do uh, offer that ability. So you can run it as an advanced uh, report or just our standard default report and pop it into Excel or uh, PDF. Now, I, I want to go back to the presentation and show you this one piece uh, here. So I've just grabbed this from a, a vehicle that I know gets a fair amount of uh, engine data. And you can see here that we're getting engine coolant temperature. And all of these pieces that we see here, we can actually create rules on in the system. So because this vehicle is getting engine coolant temperature, I can create a rule if I want to know if it, if it goes over a certain degree, basically. So this one is saying 21 Celsius. You know, I want to know if it goes over 25. Uh, I can create a rule so that when that log comes in, okay, it's 26, it's going to alert me either right away or within a report. And then I can kind of look at the, the vehicle. I'm actually also seeing parking brakes, left turn signals, right turn signals. Uh, we can even see that they have an idle shutdown timer. So that means that uh, if they idle for too long, the vehicle will automatically just shut itself down. So some pretty cool stuff that we see on this vehicle here. And we're, we're not limited to what we see. It really depends on the make and model of the vehicle and the year as well. So the newer the vehicles are, the more data we seem to be getting these days. So definitely I recommend going into the engine measurements uh, on your fleet and just taking a look and see what we're getting on those vehicles. And now you can start to measure that information and create your rules and run your and create your reports, you know, based on the information that you want to see. I'm just going to switch over into engine faults. So in addition to viewing the engine data, or the engine measurements that we just looked at, we actually also pass through any engine faults that come through on the vehicle. Now, I want to be clear when I say pass through. So we, we're not altering anything with these fault codes. We're just uh, reading them from the vehicle, so we're passing them through to the system. We do also, because we're getting that engine data, we can actually tell you if the, you know, the vehicle warning light was on at the same time. So you can really get a good picture of what's happening with the vehicle. Now, once again, I'm not really going to go through all these step-by-steps. I want to just maybe pop back over into my databases here and look at engine faults. So same area, we go to engine and maintenance, select engine data, and click on engine faults. Now you can see here that our options are similar again. We've got our, our date and time periods. We can run it by custom. We can choose one vehicle or we can choose every vehicle in the fleet. I've, for this example, I've just chosen the one. And I can search for diagnostics if I want to, but really I don't want to in this, really in this report because I just want to look at any faults that are happening on the vehicle. Now we do have the option to show d dismiss faults, and I'll go over dismiss faults in a, in a short little while here. So what I've done is I've run a, a report on this particular vehicle here, and this is um, 
a vehicle that I know that uh, was actually in the shop at the time that I've, I ran this report. So you can see here that we're not only getting the vehicle faults, but we're actually getting the faults that have happened with the telematics device. We can see here that uh, the tel telematics device threw a fault saying that the all power was removed and the device restarted. So I know that this vehicle was in the shop and they had unplugged uh, the device at some point and plugged it back in. But I'm also seeing the general vehicle warning light and what's related to the general vehicle warning light is this cylinder one misfire detected. So let's say on my vehicle, I've got a device in my car. If the warning light comes on, I don't necessarily have to bring it to the shop. For them to plug in their scan tool and figure out what, uh, what fault is being thrown in the vehicle, I can just plug in my, my Go device and it will tell me right away what exactly is happening with the vehicle. So you can go to the shop with a little bit more knowledge. Uh, your maintenance guys can actually take a look at what that fault means and they can look it up and see how they can repair that and bring the vehicle in. So it's, it's really helpful in being proactive. Once again, you can run these reports in Excel. You can schedule them to be emailed on a daily, weekly, whichever basis that you want so that you can keep on top of your fleet and make sure that you're catching these faults uh, before they get too bad. Now, I did talk about dismissing faults. So there's a couple of ways that you can dismiss a fault. And really, the, the purpose of dismissing a fault is just to have it not show in the report when you run it again. You're like, yep, we've already dealt with that. I'm just going to dismiss it. I don't need to look at it again. It's not like it's something that I, I have to urgently look at anymore. I've already dealt with it. So you could click on this uh, check mark, and you can select individual faults. You can select all that are in the filter, filter meaning uh, up here in this, in this filter, uh, or you can select what's visible right now. So if I were to select individual, I would, you know, I'd have my little check boxes here. Maybe I want to dismiss the cylinder one misfire and this, and maybe just leave the, the restart because I just want to maybe look at that later in a little bit more detail. So I can definitely do that. I would just select those and I would click on dismiss selected faults and they would disappear from the list. That's where this option comes into play, show dismiss faults. So it's not that they are gone for good, but by default we don't show the dismiss faults because really that's you just want to look at the active faults, um, but you can run the report to see what, dis what faults were dismissed for that time period. Another way to do it, let me just click on none, is to actually click on the fault itself. Now if I I had more than one cylinder one misfire detected for this time period, it would show me an incident count of how many times we saw that. So I could click on that and it gives me a little bit more detail of when it occurred. So you can see I now have my date and my time and you can see that it actually is already selected so I can choose to dismiss the fault from here as well. If I don't want to dismiss it yet, I can just cancel and it will bring me back out to that screen. Now, I always talk about reporting, and there are some ways that you can report on engine faults. A couple of, of good ideas that we have here, but obviously we're not limited to this. It's just some examples. The top right is just showing basically how many faults there are on the vehicles. And this was filtered down to just OBD faults. So I only want to know about the OBD source. We will show you J1939, J1708 as well. So that's just kind of a high level, probably good for a dashboard so that someone, when they log in, the maintenance guy can log in and say, okay, well, we've got a lot of faults going on in these vehicles. They can click on that report, open it up, and it will give them that detailed information. The bottom left one here, it's looking at um, kind of almost driver management uh, as well as vehicle management. We want to know what percentage of the days for the time period that the vehicle was driving, did they have their engine light on? You know, were they driving... 80% of the time with an engine light on and didn't tell anybody that the engine light was on. So it's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty neat report uh, that you can throw into the system there. Once again, not limited to these. These are just kind of some ideas on how you can view the data and if any of our reports can be scheduled once again. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the maintenance reminders. The maintenance reminder uh, area of the software can actually be a pretty neat tool. So it's really meant to not only where you can record maintenance and service history, but our system will actually set up reminders to let you know that you're due or overdue for service based on the um, information that you put in the system. So 
some of the default mind types we have in the system are oil change, high rotation, lease expiry, and license expiry. Uh, these are types, so similar to zones, you can create your own uh, reminder types, and I'll walk you through that. So once again, I've got my workflow here, but I'm just going to pop back over to the uh, database. And let's go into engine maintenance once again, and we're going to click on reminders. Now, from here, you can see my options popped up right away. So this is allowing me to run a report to see which vehicles have maintenance due. Uh, I can also run a report to see uh, the maintenance history. And you can see my options change a little bit there. If I want to know about reminders due, I can choose the rules that are in the system. Actually, let me just pop back over to this one here. There we go. So we've got a, just a little shorter list here. So uh, some of the reminders that are in this system currently are tire rotation, there was a test for an oil change, and then uh, a light duty oil change. This is where you can have your types come into play. You may have oil changes, but you may have multiple different types of, of oil changes. You know, you, you want to be reminded for the light duty, maybe a little bit less, for the heavy duty, you know, different, different criteria. So you can, you can create your own custom uh, reminder rules, and I'll we'll walk you through that one second. You can choose your vehicles that you want to run it for, and then if they're overdue, if they're due today, if they're due within the next couple of weeks, 30 days, 45 days. And then you can choose your mileage or engine errors. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually show you how to go through and create the rule, and some of those options will make a little bit more sense. So to create a rule, you would go to Reminder Rules, and that's going to give me a list of all the existing reminder rules that are in the system. So I can add a reminder rule, or I can take a look at these, see what vehicles are assigned to that rule. I can add more vehicles to that rule, or I can edit the rule. So the light duty oil change was one that I actually created, and I'll show you what it looks like. So this is exactly what would come up if I were to click on add. It's going to ask you to name the reminder. So just a description, I wanted to call this light duty oil change because maybe I want to create one for medium duty and heavy duty. Reminder rule type, you can see I've got oil change, tire rotation, license expiry. Then I've got a new one here called quarterly maintenance that I created. Similar to zones, you can create uh, your own types. So if you are creating a new reminder and our defaults don't really fit what you're looking for. You can click on Add New Type, and you can see the grayed out ones are the ones that are default in the system, so they cannot be edited or removed. But then this one that's got a light blue color is uh, a new one that I've created. So let's say I want to add another one, and let's call this uh, Monthly Maintenance. Click on Save. It's now in the list, and I can select that now. I can see that I now have that here, and I can go back, and I should now have that as an option. So now I have monthly maintenance as an option. For this particular one, it was an oil change, so I want to keep it as oil change. And the great thing about kind of typing them or grouping the, the uh, reminders is that I can view all the oil change reminders, and I can have my light duty, my medium duty, my heavy duty, and so forth, similar with the other ones. Now, we do have a, a couple of different options here. You can create a reminder based on time, and now you can see here that I can have it set to recur every three months, so maybe every three months I want to know, uh, I want the vehicles brought in for an oil change. Or I can just do a once-off and just pick a, a particular date here. I can also say I don't really want to create this rule based on time, I want it based on mileage only or engine hours only, so I can select no and it will only look at this criteria here. The second piece here is looking at mileage, so maybe it's every 6,000 miles I want them to be brought in for an oil change, or uh, based on a certain amount of engine hours. I cannot choose both, it has to be one or the other. But if I were to choose the way I see it now, I'm saying uh, recurs every three months, but I'm also showing uh, I want to know based on the mileage as well. So it's going to be an, an either or. So if three months has comes up or if the 6,000 miles has come up. So now I can actually just add a vehicle to the rule. I've already done so uh, with this one here, and I'll show you what it looks like. 
add vehicles. When I click on add vehicle, it uh, gives me the drop down so I can choose a vehicle that I want to add to the system. And basically what I'm doing here is I'm putting in the last time the maintenance was completed. Vehicle 45897, I've already entered that information so I can't edit it, um, but I can for the new one that I've entered. So I could say that maybe July 1st was the last time that they had an oil change and the odometer was at, I don't know, 15,000. The engine hours were at 256. That's just basically me entering in when the last time they had an oil change was, what the odometer was, and what the engine hours were. This helps us to know when the vehicle is due for service. Because we're getting that information from the engine, we're getting that odometer information, and we're getting that engine hour information, we can calculate from what the last one was to what the current value is and how far away they are from needing an oil change. So if I click on save, you can see now here that I have two vehicles that will receive reminders for the light duty oil change. So now you can see I've, I'm back to my, my list of reminder rules. And I can simply just go back to my reminder section here and I can run my report to see if any of my vehicles are due for service. I'm going to run it for the light duty oil change and I'm going to select these two vehicles. Once again, I can choose to include historic data as well. Now, let's say I want to look if they're due in the next two weeks. I can look at next two weeks, or because I know that rule is based on mileage, I can choose mileage as well. I'll keep that one at, at 500, and I'm just going to apply the changes. Right away, you can see here that vehicle 45897 says that it is due in 300 miles and it's telling me that it's a light duty oil change. So it will actually give me what is actually due and when. So we can once again run reports on this. You can run it for the entire fleet and then you can, you can print out the report and you can schedule it maybe on a, on a daily basis or a weekly basis. You can even see which ones are overdue. They should have had an oil change but they haven't or we haven't entered it into the system yet. You can see that as well. Now from here, let's say it says the event is due in 300 miles, but they've actually already gotten the oil change done, but we haven't updated the system yet. So I can simply just click on the plus sign here, and it's going to give me the option to enter my previous maintenance information. So let's say yesterday we actually got the oil change done, so I'm going to choose yesterday. Now, it's giving me an estimated odometer and an estimated engine hours. These are not edited fields. It's just giving you an idea of what the vehicle or the device is actually reading uh, from the vehicle. The editable fields will be vehicle odometer and engine hours, as well as comments. Let's say yesterday is when the oil change was done. My current odometer reading is 11,438. I know that when the vehicle got an oil change was, let's say, 11,238, and the engine hours were, I don't know, 167. So now what we're doing is we're telling them this is what the odometer value was at the time the vehicle was serviced. So now the rule can start over again, and it can do its calculations based on these odometer values and the current odometer for the vehicle. So I could put in my comments, so I can say uh, oil changed and oil filter replaced. And then I can just click on save. It's going to bring me back to the main screen here. No reminders are currently due because I've just updated it, so it's going to be a while for next time uh, that this vehicle is due for an oil change. And one final thing, I know we only have a couple minutes left, uh, I can run a maintenance history report. So maintenance history, light duty oil change is what I want to look at. I want to view all vehicles and I'm going to look for this week. Apply changes. Right away you can see there's my vehicle, 45897. It was yesterday, which is what I just did. It tells me what the odometer was when I entered it and what the engine hours were. So right away you can see all of the maintenance for the vehicle uh, for the time period that you choose. 
And that about does it. I think I, I, I really cut it close there. I apologize. But um, let's open it up for, for questions. Carrie, if we have any. There have been a multitude of questions. However, I think probably the most important one that has come up is how can we ensure that the maintenance reminders go out so that they can be proactive as opposed to having to go into the maintenance area to find it? Absolutely. So let me just pop back into my database here. I have created a report that can be triggered, uh, basically, when something is due. Our standard uh, maintenance report, let me just go pop into here. Our standard reminder report, let me go back, back here. Reminders due, I'm going to choose my light duty oil change, this vehicle here. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about actual scheduled reports. I just want to show you what it'll look like. You can schedule a report to be sent on a daily basis if you want to, and it will show you if the vehicle is due for maintenance. It won't necessarily trigger, the default one won't necessarily trigger if it's coming up or if it's within a, a day or two, but the one that I've created actually will do that for you. So I'm just opening it up here. Should be an Excel report. So basically what I've done here, and it says here, the maintenance report will only send if the due date, distance, or hours are within the values you specify to the left right here. You can edit any of the values in B5 to B7 on this summary tab. So let's say you want a report that's going to generate whenever the due date is within five days or the distance is in within 3,000 miles or kilometers, depending on what you're running it in or 150 hours. So you can run it for multiple rules and if you change these values then the report will actually trigger only when those conditions are met. So it's a little bit of a hidden feature. We do have this uh, thing called send report. By default it's always set at true which means the report's just going to send no matter what. But I've created some formulas in here that will basically look at if any of these conditions are met, it will send the report. So you could set the report to be scheduled daily and only if the due date, the due distance, or the engine hours are within uh, this range, will it send the report. Otherwise, it won't send the report. So you're only receiving the report when you really, really need it. I hope that answers the question. We are working on a, uh, we do have a custom report repository on our knowledge base, but we are working on a marketplace on our uh, website, which is going to have uh, reports as well as uh, other add-ins into the system. Uh, so I will be putting this maintenance reminder one up on the marketplace when we launch it, which I think should be uh, shortly, so that you will be able to, to download this and insert it into your database. Okay. All right. Thanks, Angie. That's terrific. As far as uh, our marketplace goes, yes, it should be launched July the 15th. And with that, we will have all of Angie's great reports on there and a whole bunch of other stuff that we're excited about. So you can look for that on the 15th of July and following. We also want to comment on Connect. We are looking for your registrations. That's very important. So please, uh, if you need more information, don't hesitate to reach out to your account managers. And with that, I'm going to say thank you so much for joining us and we will talk to you next week.